Okay, uh, let's uh, start. So, uh, Piazza had sent uh, announcement out. So, uh, the short presentations. Uh, so, I have sort of given a bunch, bunch of instructions out here. But the main thing I wanted to explain was, uh, let's see. Okay, so you would notice that for some of the talks I have two names, and in which case you have a thirty-minute slot. If it's a single-person name, it's a one-person one-person. Uh, uh, it's a 15 minute slot. You should uh, set aside some time for Q&A and keep the number of slides limited. So I also wanted to kind of tell you how to go around these things. So let's take this topic. So the idea is that there are lots of cloud services and software packages. Uh, so basically the difference is that everything is a software package. In some cases a hosted service, in some cases a package you can download and run on your own machine. Uh, and what uh, this topic is looking at is software which lets you log sensor data. That is your device or your. How can we actually get our partner's email address to contact them? Uh, okay. Uh, I'll 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 just post it on Piazza. Okay. okay. Yeah, names and emails. Okay. Good point. Uh, you could always kind of pass yeah. on Piazza, but it's easier for me to do that. Okay. So I'll do that. Uh, so, uh, so the idea out here is these are software packages which uh, where devices can send, send time series data, uh, and then these things uh, store them. Uh, then they also provide sometimes additional services like visualization. So they may have a website to which you can go. They'll also provide uh, ability for other applications to pull the data out, as well as in some cases they may also have. Um, uh, features whereby you can do things like if the data matches some value, exceeds some threshold, then do some action. So there might be a little bit of an action type thing also. Um, internally, these are basically glorified databases around which they have some wrappers. Usually, they offer some sort of an API to talk to. Um, uh, commercial services obviously require a paid thing, whereas there are packages. Uh, this Fant is out of Spark Fun, kind of the company which sells a lot of these sensor parts and all Nimbits and open source package, as well as a hosted service and there are some that I have put out there. Now you would see in each one of these I put a lot of names out there. Okay, and obviously there are way, way, way too many for for you to go in depth and everything. Okay, so kind of the idea uh, is that there are two things that a talk like this should do. It should kind of firstly just give a general sense of the landscape of things because some of these things have some pretty may have some in, intriguing feature uh, versus others maybe just uh, vanilla. So kind of you can imagine that sort of a quick high level thing of what what these things do, uh, what's the competitive landscape, and then take a couple uh, of representative examples and um, for one of them maybe walk through a little bit like how if you were designing using that what would you need to do like for example let's take Zively. So Zively offers an API it's kind of you know, basically your device or your application uh, has to periodically use a RESTful API basically JS, uh, JSON data format over HTTP to make calls and in that you have the time series and they have these concepts like uh, stream, uh, sample, uh, the time series represented in a particular way. Uh, then on the back end uh, they have other capabilities like visualization and doing certain actions. So kind of give a sense of like how one would use one of these systems. It could be any one of these okay uh, that you could pick and sort of um, maybe pick a couple of representative ones, so like in this particular case, maybe it's Zively and Fant because they represent a service and a piece of software, for example. Second topic is large scale IoT connectivity. So, what this refers to is uh, so, so these are services and software, and you are talking to them. This topic looks at how how do these how do you talk to them in the sense that as the data is carried from your device to a service or between two services, then what are the different standards in play out there? In some cases, it's just custom stuff, but then there are also uh, several uh, uh, quasi standards which have emerged. For example, MQTT. This is something out of IBM. Um, uh, it. Forget what it stands for, but basic idea is to exchange uh, telemetry data, okay, the sensor type data. And uh, some of these services you would see that, in addition to the proprietary ones, will also support MQTT, for example. Okay, MQTT is actually quite popular. Uh, CoAP is actually uh, 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 sort of uh, it's an application protocol for constrained devices. It's constrained 
app, uh, application protocol or something like that, the full name. And you can think of it as uh, RESTful API slash HTTP for very low end, whatever, bandwidth constrained devices and also it's a standard. Um, Open DMTP is another standard device, something, something, something. Uh, uh, and a very common one simply is that uh, services and software define their own kind of API. So I've given some examples. Uh, they are neither meant to be exclusive nor are they meant to be uh, in the sense you can go beyond them and you can subset out of them. So that was the second topic. Uh, third one, all seen, all joined. So this is actually uh, an effort which came out of Qualcomm and then has become a industry consortium. And what this is is that um, so. Uh, so here it's connectivity simply in the sense of how you send data and commands and kind of thing. Here uh, it uh, goes beyond that, um, that uh, how could we have uh, over whatever transport you have picked, how can we have some uh, that different products can understand each other. And a couple of things, how they can discover each other, like I buy something from a IoT device from the store, put it in my home network, uh, how does it know what else is out there at my home, how does it interact? So this requires kind of a discovery thing, which is who is out there and then exchange some information so that they can speak to each other. Because otherwise what may happen is each one of the, each one of the products may have some, uh, maybe using the same transport, but they speak different language. So we may all write in the same alphabet but we may have a different language. The idea out here is a common language associated with discovery and other capabilities. So like for example, let's say a speaker can advertise that, hey, I can emit sound, okay, and uh, or uh, switch can basically say, I can control such and such light bulb, things like that, or a therm uh, temperature sensor that I can provide uh, temperature reading. So they have various profiles and all, uh, but kind of basic idea is that devices as well as your phones and computers can ex exchange their information about the capabilities. Uh, so that's this one. Wireless networking for IoT. So a lot of devices are uh, wireless and it has led to the emergence of several um, short range -ish, um, wireless standards and I've kind of uh, basically given three because I think they collectively cover kind of the space very well. So this topic, the idea is you go into these three. So heart is a real time networking protocol and wireless heart is a wireless version of it. Uh, it's uh, designed to give very deterministic latency bound kind of networking capabilities. So think of it like the real time counterpart on wireless networks. Uh, Z-Wave is something which a lot of home products use. In fact, um, yeah, so it's not open standard, it's actually just dictated by a company, but uh, other companies license out of them. Uh, it's a multi-hop <coughs> network and it has things on how the data is transmitted, uh, security related issues as kind of a complete stack. And you can think of this stuff as kind of similar in capabilities and now a lot more, uh, but open. It's just the IEEE standard. So this is the basic physical slash medium access control part of the network. Zigbee is a set of things built on top of it. Six low pan refers to that on top of that, how we can have everything on the IP network. Um, uh, so IPv6 specifically. Um, and then finally, Thread is a Google, uh, Google is pushing this consortium called Thread, which on top of all of these has some additional goodies to kind of make it uh, be kind of for the physical type devices, kind of the main thing. So they kind of fall under the same umbrella, so I put it out there. Um, then there are interoperability standards which are targeted for industrial uh, type stuff as opposed to home and all. So BACnet, Modbus, Lawnworks, these are actually uh, pretty old, they're like 30 years, 20, 30 years old stuff, but they're very pervasive like uh, commercial buildings and also a lot of products at home like if you have an HVAC unit and all it might very well be talking using these. So these are all wired buses. Um, um, uh, Plus a lot of software layers de defined on top of it. So BACnet is actually a, there's certainly a physical part to it, but BACnet uh, has a very complicated uh, software structure on top of it, for example. OPC stands for OLE for something. So OLE is object link linking stuff that Microsoft kind of pushed so that you can have objects on a network. And uh, OPC is basically, uh, uh, OLE for some control type application. So it's also very commonly found in products. 
Then uh, the next one uh, is a work out of Berkeley, which now um, is both kind of an open source software and then there's a company called Building Robotics, which uh, it's commercialized this thing and it basically is kind of a modern version of these things in the sense that uh, BACnet and all uh, are architecturally quite old. Of these actually BACnet is the newest, BACnet came in uh, more recently whereas Modbus is like 70s. Berkeley SMAP kind of looks at these things from a more modern computer science perspective that how could we adopt more recent software engineering principles and all and database technologies to structure this thing. Uh, they had a paper at a conference called Census, which is a sensing conference. Uh, I think it was in 2011 or 12, uh, but the current system is significantly different from it. So even though kind of motivation and all is there, but kind of the specific details have changed quite a bit, but they have a lot of documents. Uh, next one um, is uh, going over time series databases. So databases abound and there are very broadly two types of database out there in the world. One are so called relational database, well three. One is you store data in files, okay, so uh, in which case it's just a flat file system, you, data comes in, somehow you figure out divide it into files. Then you have relational databases which uh, are have been around for quite a while where you store things in tables, so kind of a long tables, each row represents a new record, a new object if you may. But uh, every object has kind of the same set of um, uh, fields in it. And then more recently so-called non-relational databases uh, have emerged where essentially you can store kind of an arbitrary data structure. Um, and they have become very popular because they have certain advantages as well. So. There, have, there are time series extensions to both of them, uh, like you can basically store time series in, uh, even in a file, you can just kind of uh, use a Excel or a CSV file and store a time series. Uh, you can store them in there also, but there are also dedicated time series databases. Not all of them emerged because of sensing oriented data, some of them also emerged because even in regular computing we need to store time series kind of data, like for example what was the load on my computer over time or um, so these, these kind of things kind of time series data abound but not uh, beyond sensors. So there are some that I have listed out there so like reading DB for example <coughs> is what Berkeley SMAP uses for example. Uh, but there are a bunch of others also I've also pointed to some articles. And then kind of the final part is that to simplify programming on embedded devices there is a trend now that uh, letting people use higher level languages and by higher level what I mean are languages which are kind of more scripting languages don't have to compile and also kind of traditionally embedded systems have been around uh, right in C, C++ or uh, kind of more normal systems languages. One language which has got a lot of attention in this regard is JavaScript and kind of a big driver behind why JavaScript has become uh, very common in these kind of physical computing devices is because there is a package called node.js which is an event driven programming environment. It was created to write servers because servers also are event driven, they get requests, they have to respond, but it turns out that programming paradigm is also very good, very very well matched to embedded systems as we saw kind of we get a whole bunch of events out there. On top of it, there are uh, re real-time event-based communication packages, so there is one called socket.io on top of that, it's very popular, and then on top of that, there are entire physical computing frameworks that, uh, there's several of them. I could have picked one called Cylon.js, which actually supports a whole bunch of robots and embedded platform, including, for example, BeagleBone and Raspberry Pi and all, uh, and there are plenty of good documentation out there. But there are other, there's something called device.js, and there are a couple of others like that. So these are all basically making use of the event-driven programming paradigm. You would see that node.js actually has the concept of the handlers and all that we talked about uh, in structuring this. So anyway, I have given uh, names against each one of these. Uh, just want to check everyone there, okay. So I know these two are there, Bo is here, Ivan is here, uh, Nijun, who's Nijun? Okay, so you're here, okay, cool. Uh, Benam and Fatima are both in the class, Kwan Lin, who's Kwan Lin? Kwan Lin, nope, 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 nope. Okay, I may have to find you a new partner. <laughs> okay, uh, um, Apak is, yeah, you are here, that's true, Sunny. And Dennis, okay, so we have good for there. Jijiang, 
Okay, yeah, that's you and our test. Okay, cool. Okay, so I guess I'm missing possibly one name out here. So let me have to. Okay. And then the remaining uh, ones, I'm going to kind of fill out some more topics if you along these lines. If any of you are in this latter part of the list and have a particular fascination with some topic, send me your suggestion. Um, I will uh, are you Quan Lin by any chance? Okay. <laughs> I thought you had dropped out of the class. Okay. Um, okay, cool. So any questions on this thing? And what I would like you to do is to send me the PDFs of your presentation uh, by uh, evening before or the kind of at least an hour uh, before the class. If not, bring it on a USB stick, okay? It's because as you know, we are recording things. I would like the pre presentation to be done from my laptop. So, uh, and make sure that you have a PDF because PowerPoint from PCs don't scale very well out here. So I don't want to run into those problems. So just a PDF that we can just kind of project out there. So, uh, so you're yeah, welcome to just bring it on a USB stick uh, prior to the class. Okay, so um, last time around, we kind of saw um, um, rate monotonic, deadline monotonic, uh, and um, uh, how under static priority situations they are optimal. Then we kind of started down this path that let's kind of break down some of these uh, assumptions behind uh, the thing one at a time. And one one big assumption that we had this far was that tasks were independent. But of course, if the tasks interact, then there's a possibility that one task may block another task because it has the resources. We started down this path, and that can affect the ability to meet timing uh, constraints. So, for example, uh, a high priority task comes, but it needs a resource, and then the resource is locked by some other lower priority task. And if you were to not do anything, then uh, potentially that could be a long period of time before the resource would be freed. And in particular, the problem that I highlighted was that it could be that uh, the resource is locked by a very low priority task and meanwhile uh, that task is not getting a chance to run because there are other intermediate priority tasks and then there is some really high priority task in our example task one which kind of is waiting on it. So that's kind of the issue and this is called priority inversion and intuitively what we would like to do out here is that if such a situation happens then we want to change the priority of the task which had the, which has locked the resource so that uh, we are not uh, holding back a high priority task. So that's kind of an intuitive concept but not done right it can create its own problem. So, so we want task one which is the highest priority task ideally should not be blocked for any more time than the time needed for task three to come out of the critical section right. So we don't want it to be uh, stuck any longer because task one is the highest priority task. The problem though is as we saw that task three can be, if we were to just run according to standard static priority rules that is highest priority ready to run task has a CPU, then task three can be repeatedly preempted by task two which was the intermediate priority. So, uh, so what's happening in this case is that uh, the amount of time task one is getting blocked is not just decided by the length of the time for that critical code, but also sort of other timing parameters, other tasks. Now, this issue was um, sort of in early days not very well understood. So in fact, uh, one of the very high profile failures uh, of our system was actually the Mars Pathfinder mission in, back in late 90s. And sort of what was happening was that after this little robot was deployed, going around Mars, it would repeatedly crash and then restart, okay, and uh, it took, uh, and kind of obviously uh, the media reports kind of put it at softer glitch. Now behind the scene what was happening was uh, uh, that the glitch in this case really was a priority inversion problem. Basically what was happening was that a high priority task uh, was missing its deadline and whenever, so it would not finish by the deadline and then there was 
a supervisory task whose job was that if it would see that uh, this critical task was missing its deadline, then it would say, hey, something is wrong, and it would reset the whole system. Okay, so this is what is called as watchdog timer in embedded systems. So watchdog timers are basically uh, kind of spe usually special, uh, they, they, are, they are implemented in hardware, and kind of the idea is that to make sure something finishes in time, then when you're starting that something, you will start the watchdog timer, and then at the end of the task, you are supposed to reset the timer. So let's say I'm starting on a task which is supposed to take no more than 10 milliseconds. So at the beginning, I will tell the watchdog timer, count down 10 milliseconds. And at the end of my function, I will go and reset uh, or stop that watchdog timer. If I fail to do it, then the watchdog timer will uh, send an interrupt to the processor and some interrupt handler will kick in and then kind of realize something is going amok. So that was kind of the fundamentally the problem and it got triggered because uh, so they had a bunch of sensing tasks and all. I'm not going to go through uh, this thing uh, in gory detail but basically kind of the classic situation there was a high priority task which was being blocked by a low priority task which had a shared resource okay so exactly the scenario of priority inversion and what was happening was that as a um, in this particular case there was a lot more interesting data being collected by that low priority task so it was getting it was taking more time essentially they had budgeted for certain amount of interesting sensory data to come in and there were more interesting stuff happening uh, so more time was being taken and so the high priority task which was using the same shared resource was getting blocked uh, more frequently and then there was this even higher priority task which uh, uh, would notice that uh, things were not finishing in time and it was resetting the system so that's that was kind of happening repeatedly uh, what happened this part uh, so so basically they have to kind of fix it now it turns out that uh, there are ways and that's as you'll see that how you could kind of fix this thing now in their particular case what kind of saved the day was that the operating system that they were using uh, industrial operating system called VxWorks is very common in embedded systems it actually did provide the mechanism where you can set a flag on every semaphore every shared resource to behave differently and uh, it turned out that uh, there was a way through the command line to really globally enable that feature. So basically from Earth, they once they figured it out what was going on, they kind of set, set a command uh, to kind of enable this thing. And they had a exactly identi uh, identical copy of the system running back here, JPL, and so they were able to kind of uh, diagnose and what was kind of happening. So then they set a patched software up there and kind of fix it. Now, why was it not caught? Uh, the problem was that um, uh, that it, there are only certain conditions in the system, certain input situations when this bug would uh, would get triggered. And uh, yeah, basically, what was happening was that uh, they kind of focused on the more important part of the software, kind of the one which controls the robot and all, and kind of the sensing was like, okay, it's this best effort, not not very important, um, and but because it got overloaded, it kind of brought everything else down. Uh, they did see the problem beforehand, but it was not reproducible, not explainable, because these things happen very rarely. Uh, usually hardware glitches, or you kind of just say, okay, I'm going to over-provision this thing, and essentially kind of other software was the higher priority one. So um, uh, the thing which comes up out here is that um, these kind of problems are best done, uh, avoided as opposed to kind of once once they happen, it's very hard to reproduce uh, because something crashes, you get a report, but your input situation, even if it differs in timing, the values may be the same, but if your event arrives slightly differently, the system will behave differently. So anytime you're dealing with bugs and all that are triggered by things occurring in a specific time sequence, they're uh, sort of much, much harder to uh, diagnose. Uh, so, uh, so that that's that's what happens. Let's look at like what we can do about this thing. So let's look at a uh, example. So let's say we have a system where I have four things happening. So these are the four processes or four tasks, and they have the priority which is given out there. And then to kind of um, see what is uh, happening in each one of the tasks. So the letter E refers to one unit of execution. 
and the letter Q means one unit of execution with the critical resource Q. V means uh, one unit of execution with the critical resource V. So I have two shared resources Q and V. They could be, let's say, some hardware devices. So L4 needs Q and V. There is no nesting. So it executes, executes, uses Q, uses V, executes. Um, L3 executes, uses V, uses V, executes, and L2 doesn't use any shared resource, and L1 uses the resource Q for four time units. Okay, so that's kind of the basic structure. And then moreover, let's imagine that sometime during the runtime of the system, I have a job corresponding to L4, 3, 2, and 1 released at those times. So at time 0, uh, job for L1 arrived, at time 2, L2 and L3 arrived, at time 4, L4 arrived. Now, if we, and I mean, this, uh, this is obviously a, a deliberately created example to illustrate the point, but it can very well happen in a running system. So, uh, in this case, what's happening now is so L1 got released as 0. It's the highest priority task. It's the only task at this point. So, it executes for one time unit, and then it goes ahead and uses Q. Now, one thing to bear in mind is before using Q, it has to lock Q, and then it is using Q all this time, and then it will release Q out here. And uh, so what's happening is it locks Q out here and starts using Q. And then at time equal to 2, L2 and L3 arrived and both are ready to run but L3 is higher priority so it gets a CPU. And if you look at L3, it's one unit of execution and then resource V. So it runs and then locks the resource V. So V is indicated by bottom left to top right hatching and uh, this is the other way around. Okay, So uh, hopefully you can see it from afar. So L3 uses uh, this, then at equal to 4, L4 arrives, and L4 is the highest priority task. So L4 begins to run. It, uh, again, going back out here, it can, it has two units of execution, uh, two, two time units of execution, so it does that. But then it needs Q, right? Uh, yeah, it needs Q, but Q is locked. Uh, Q is locked by L1 out here. So at this stage, remember, intuitively we would have wanted L1 to get the CPU, but that's not what will happen. Uh, L3 will get the CPU because L3 is the highest priority task running. So L3 will keep using V, release V, finish this final bit of execution. Then at that stage, L2 gets the CPU, L2 runs for two units of time. Only then the CPU is given to L1, L1 kind of runs, and then uh, task for uh, L4 gets gets to run and finish, and then finally L1 gets to run its final bit. So this is basically following the policy that highest priority ready to run task is running. Okay, there's nothing special being done. The problem that we are seeing is that the highest priority task is waiting for a long time, much much longer than what should have otherwise happened. Remember, at this stage, uh, L1 had only three units of Q left. So ideally, we would have wanted this blocking time to be no more than three. In fact, ideally, uh, in the worst case, we would never want this blocking time to be more than four time units because if you're really unlucky and we, that L task four came just after task one locked the resource, then I have to wait for that time. So ideally, I should not have to wait for, the highest priority task should not have to wait for more than that time. But what's happening out here is it's waiting for a much, much longer time. So one uh, policy out here is that, okay, we can say we can, in, let this guy get the priority of the higher task. So I could do that. So this is priority inherent inheritance concept. So kind of the idea is now that task one uh, uh, will get the priority of uh, task four because it is blocking task four. So the moment uh, it happens that uh, a task has a resource and as a result of that resource, it is now blocking a higher priority task, then whenever that situation happens, then the OS will give uh, high priority to this task. Uh, so in that case, we are good to go. Uh, so task one gets the high priority. Uh, out here, so task one begins to run instead of task two and three. And at that stage, uh, after it has released this queue, uh, we task one, sorry, task four gets the CPU, it finishes queue. But task four also needs V. If you recall, task four also needs V. But meanwhile, what has happened is that this guy has blocked V. So what's going to happen is uh, it needs V out here, but it cannot have V. So again, control passes back to L3. 
and it finishes using V, only then the CPU goes back out here. So now in this case, there's still an undesirable thing that I may actually get end up getting blocked multiple times. So if the highest priority task, if a high priority task is using multiple resources, then on each one of them, it may have it may get blocked by a low priority task, okay? And that's, uh, it would be good to avoid that situation also. There is no reason that, uh, because there may be many, many resources in a system. And if in the worst case, I have to wait for each one of them because it was blocked by a low priority task, then you have a problem. Even worse, things could have been a little bit, uh, we could have been a bit of a soup if there was a nesting problem in the sense that um, uh, if, in, I lock a resource and I lock another resource and the other party does it exactly the reverse so you can enter into a deadlock situation also. So it would be good uh, if we can avoid these kind of situations. So avoid this cascading of uh, uh, cascading effect where I have to repeatedly wait for every resource. But let's look at this priority inheritance because priority inheritance is very commonly found in some of the operating systems where you can basically say that uh, a resource uh, uh, can inherit the priority, okay? And whenever you say a resource can inherit the priority, what that means is that if a task has grabbed the resource and then some other task makes the request for the same resource and that other task is a higher priority task, then the task which has currently grabbed the resource gets the priority, okay? So there is a bit of a dynamic priority which creeps in. Now, what happens in this particular case though is that if you were to look at what our response time would be, so our response time is going to be, so response time for ith task is going to be whatever it needs for computation plus how so much time it is going to be blocked because of shared resources plus this is the term we had seen last time around which is the interference from high priority tasks. This is inevitable because this is basically saying that if there is a high priority task ready to run, uh, I have to be prepared to give the CPU to that. But this blocking is going to happen because of lower priority tasks, pr those tasks which are lower in priority than I. And question then becomes, uh, what, what can, uh, when, when can it happen? So let's imagine that I have k, uppercase k resources, and we define usage k comma i as shown in the following slide, usage k, k comma i means if resource number k is used by at least one process which has a lower priority and at least one process which has a priority greater than or equal to mine. Okay, so um, go back out here. Let's say if I were to look at task 2. Okay, task 2 is not using any resource. But as we see, task 2 can nevertheless get blocked by the lower priority task because the lower priority task has a, uh, has a resource which it needs and where because of priority inheritance it gets to run, right? So when I'm looking at the timing constraints for task two, I cannot simply go by properties of the higher task. I also have to look at the fact that resource Q was being, uh, because of resource Q, the lower task was interfering with this. And what can, uh, so usage uh, means that if I'm looking at a task, then it will potentially see a blocking time for any resource which is in use by a lower priority task and by a task which is same priority or higher priority. Because then there is a possibility that because of priority inheritance, the lower priority task may grab the CPU because it may temporarily get a high priority. So usage, uh, so for L2, uh, uh, we'll say usage Q comma I, Q comma 2 is uh, 1 and likewise usage V, uh, so, so usage, uh, usage Q comma 2 is 1 because Q is being used by this guy and this guy out here top task and bottom task, but usage v comma, uh, v comma 2 is 0 because it is not being used by any low priority task. It's only being used by the two high priority tasks, which would have interfered uh, with us anyway. Okay, so there is nothing being lost out there. And now, because of the priority inheritance, the way it works is uh, a task may get blocked once for each such resource. So the total blocking time that a task will see is across all the resources, uh, whether it is a potentially blocking resource, that is it's used by a task lower priority and a task 
whose priority is higher, as well as the length of the code corresponding to that thing. Now, there is a assumption we are making out here is that every task which needs a resource needs it for the same amount of time okay if that's not the case like for example different tasks may need the resource for different amounts of time so let's say uh, if i'm looking at task number two and there's a shared resource and task number one whenever it uses it in the worst case it needs 10 units of time and task number one which is high priority whenever it needs it needs it only for five units of time then the CS of K here would be the one corresponding to the lower priority task. Okay, so you have to account for that. So uh, you can kind of for specific cases one can work it out. Main thing out here to observe is it's an additive term out here. Okay, I'm basically getting blocked once for every resource if I'm really really unlucky, and this could be uh, this could add up to a long time. Uh, now we uh, system may know about all of this the problem with this thing is that i have suddenly reduced the schedulability quite a bit that is i may have lots of task sets which i if i truly care about that worst case i will have to say that i may miss the deadline and therefore not schedule it so it would be good if one could improve the strategy uh, somewhat uh, if there was a better way of handling these shared resources so that uh, i can schedule more more of the more of the tasks any question on this one? So again, very important to remember uh, is that a task may get blocked even though it is not participating in any shared resource. It's just that it's unlucky to be sandwiched between two tasks in terms of priority and they are sharing a resource. Okay. And the other thing is uh, I may it may get blocked by uh, once for every shared resource of this nature. So this stuff in mid 90s kind of this observation that uh, these things are causing problems uh, led to kind of development uh, a lot of work at CMU in this thing with something called priority ceiling protocol. So these are more sophisticated protocols which try to achieve uh, a couple of things. So firstly they try to improve the performance by converting as we will see the sigma becomes a max. So basically we only have to worry about, uh, we, we try to make sure that we'll get blocked only once and then the worst case would be the uh, one which is the longest time duration. And the other thing is uh, also try to avoid uh, deadlock situation where I may have nested uses of resources um, which, which may cause problems. So, so priority ceiling uh, kind of uh, seeks to do that. So the basic idea in priority ceiling is um, that we begin to now also associate priorities with shared resources. So thus far we had priorities associated only with tasks. Now we also define a concept in priority ceiling. We define a priority associated with a shared resource. If there's a shared buffer or a shared radio, it also has a priority. And um, whenever, a, uh, so a priority ceiling, uh, very crudely speaking of a shared resource, is the highest priority of all the tasks that may use that resource. Okay. Now, what this means from an OS perspective is that you need to know this thing beforehand. That is, you need to know beforehand which task may use a resource, and then you need to make sure that one abides by it. So uh, you cannot simply, uh, in the middle, suddenly say, "Hey, lock this resource." Okay, that's not acceptable. You have to declare your intent beforehand at system startup time, so that the OS knows at all times what are the tasks which can use a resource and use this information uh, when deciding whether the system is schedulable or not. So, we uh, so the priority of a shared resource is the priority of the is the highest priority of all the tasks that may use that resource. Whenever a task attempts to use a resource, enter a critical section, it will be suspended unless its priority, the priority of the task, is greater than priority of all the shared resources currently in use by other tasks. Okay, so kind of the idea is that uh, you're being very prudent out here. You're basically saying that um, uh, if there are other semaphores, other shared resources, whose priority is greater than the task's priority and, and they are locked by some, something else, then I have, I'm in a potentially dangerous situation. So I should not even, so even though the, the resource that I'm trying to use may be free, I should not enter into it because there is a potential deadlock situation because I may grab it and then meanwhile, uh, since that other uh, resource is, 
is in use, the task that needs that resource may later on need the resource that I have and then we'll enter into a deadlock situation. You'll see how it plays out, but uh, this is kind of the critical step that a task will get to run. Now, no more because it's the highest priority task ready to run in the system. But rather, um, if, we, if we ever face a situation that the, uh, the task needs a resource and that resource, uh, uh, and, uh, if a task need, uh, needs a resource and at that time, if uh, there exists some other resource, whose priority is higher than the task's priority and that resource is locked by some, some task, uh, lower priority, higher priority, doesn't matter, then we are not going to enter this thing. We are not going to say this task is ready to proceed. Moreover, we say that if, uh, if the task is unable to proceed because of this preceding reason, uh, then the, uh, uh, then, uh, then the task, then the other uh, resource which is kind of blocking me because there's some other resource whose priority is higher than mine uh, and it is locked, then we say that that resource is blocking, uh, blocking me. And uh, so let's, let's see how it kind of works out. So there are two forms of this priority ceiling. So one is, uh, there are two protocols which are very popularly used. Uh, this thing. One is called original protocol, the other is called immediate ceiling protocol. Um, main properties of both these protocols are identical. That is, they do not allow deadlocks. They do not, uh, they basically make sure that a high priority process can be blocked at most once by a low priority process. Another way of saying is that this sigma becomes a max. That is, uh, the blocking occurs only because of one shared resource and not once for each shared resource. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, mutual, mutually exclusive thing is maintained. So let, let see how it kind of works out. Okay, so let's say I have two tasks. Uh, task one, task two, they share some resource, uh, S1 and S2. And what is uh, happening is, let's say task one locks S1, locks S2, unlocks S2, unlocks S1. Uh, task two locks S2, locks S1, unlocks S1, unlocks S2. And staring at this thing, you can immediately see a potential problem that what happens, so task one is higher priority. And what happens if task two comes first, locks S2, then task one comes, goes ahead, locks S1, now tries to lock S2 and is stuck because uh, this guy has S2. So this guy can proceed, but now for it to unlock S2, it needs S1, which is already locked. So you have a deadlock situation. So um, let's see how priority ceiling uh, can kind of cope with this thing. Now, in this case, we both the resources uh, have a the ceiling, uh, the priority of the resources themselves is the priority of task one because we defined that priority of a shared resource is the highest priority of all the tasks which may lock, may use that resource. So in this particular case, uh, both S1 and S2, their pr the priority of these resources is the priority of task one because task one is making use of both of them. So let's see what will happen in this particular case. So what happens is task two arrives first uh, and, uh, 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 and, and in this particular case, uh, task 2 comes, it uh, uses S2, so it's fine. So at this stage, uh, task 2 is the highest priority task in the system, so it just runs, locks S2. Task 1 comes at this time T1, task 1 runs, and now it needs to lock, uh, it needs the resource, if you look out here, it needs the resource S1. Now, what it will do out here at the stage, it needs a resource S1. Resource S1 is free, so normally it could have just proceeded with it. But because of the ceiling protocol, it will say, is there any resource whose priority is greater than or equal to mine and is locked by someone else? And that is indeed the case. There is resource S2 whose priority is greater than or equal to task 1's. And that resource is locked by some task, which is task two. And therefore, at that stage, this guy will block. It will not proceed with using S1, even though S1 was free. So it's a conservative, it has to do this thing because it has to assume that in the worst case, there can a deadlock, deadlock can occur and therefore we may be in trouble. Uh, moreover, at this stage, uh, so it stops running 
and then the only other task in the system is task two, it will run. But let's imagine hypothetically if I had other tasks out here, okay, intermediate priority one, and they were ready to run at this time. But what our policy will say is that because task one is being blocked by task two, therefore task two will get task one's priority. So at this instant, task two's priority is the same as task one's so that it can run. Uh, so that means if there's anything intermediate, they will have to wait. So now uh, this guy proceeds, keeps using S2, then uses S1, then releases S1, releases S2, and then this guy gets to run. And in this particular case, uh, the, uh, so, so we kind of, this defensive maneuver, if you may, kind of avoids this uh, problem that, uh, uh, that task one made deadlock. The other thing to bear in mind is here we had a nested, nested usage. So S2 and then inside S2, S1 was being used. Uh, so the maximum time this guy can be blocked is the maximum time I could be in S2. Uh, some other task could be in S2, which basically means that the distance between lock S2 and lock S2. Okay, so that's well, one way it can block, and the other one is the time gap between lock S1 and lock S1. So uh, you have to kind of, um, in this case, obviously the usage time for S2 is higher, so that is going to be the worst case, uh, worst case situation. So that's the intuitive idea. Details in OCPP and ICPP differ. So in OCPP, what happens is the following. Uh, each process has a static default priority, much like um, uh, as we did previously. So rate monotonic, deadline monotonic, whatnot. Each resource has a static ceiling value defined, which is the maximum of the processes that use it. So that's the same as before. A process has a dynamic priority, which is the maximum of its own priority and anyone it inherits because it's blocking something higher up. So process now has a dynamic priority because it may be blocking, uh, by using a resource, it may be blocking some higher priority process to run, and therefore whenever that happens, it gets the high priority. And then final bit is a process can only lock a resource if its dynamic priority is higher than the ceiling of any currently locked resource. So this is what we are seeing, that tau1 could not proceed because there was S2 which was currently locked and the priority of task one was not higher. So if all these, uh, so this is exactly what we had thus far and in this case, the blocking time is the maximum of all the critical sections that may exist. So you will block only once and the duration for which you can block corresponds to the worst case of the, uh, worst case of the critical section. So that's great, there's nothing better you can do than that. Yeah. <coughs> task one happens, then no problem, right? I mean, then task one is the high priority task that will keep running, right? Because then you're not. Uh, so if task one arrived before task two, then uh, there will no will not be any blocking in this situation, right? Because task one is higher priority than task two. Whenever task one comes to S one, is there any resource which is blocked by anyone else? Uh, no. So it go ahead with S one. Then when it's S2, same story, it will proceed because task 2 has lower priority, right? So it, in that case, we will behave as if it was just the standard uh, priority-driven scheduling, right? Yeah, so, so. Go ahead. Excuse me, did, did they shoot, if, if the lower priority was the resource for some small time uh, before the highest the higher resource uh, needed. I mean, you may block me. Mm -hmm. Actually, I can take resource and leave it before you need it. Did they check for the time of the? Of the no. So in that case, remember uh, the condition uh, that it is checking out here is not simply. Uh, that there exists a resource with priority equal to greater than mine, but that resource has to be locked. So if this guy, for example, had locked S2 and released S2 even before before this point in time, nothing, there's no problem, then this guy will proceed as is. The problem that's happening is that at this point in time, when task one is ready to use resource S1, it's trying to use some resource. At that point in time, there exists a resource in the system which is currently locked and the priority of that resource is greater than or equal to priority of tau 1. 
So the example you had is that if task 2 had used S2 and released it, no problems because at this time then S2 is not locked and therefore no problems with it. Also that resource has to be used by Tau right? Nope. No? No. Now in this case since we have only two tasks so that's what's happening. It could be that S2 was being used by Tau2 and something higher than Tau1. Let's say there was a Tau0 whose priority was even higher then resource S2's priority would have been the max of priority of tau 0 and priority of tau 2 and therefore it would be even higher. So, so the priority of a resource is defined as the highest among all the tasks that are using it. Uh, the decision out here is not based upon whether task 1 is using uh, S2 or not. So, that, that's a good point. So, and, and there's a very critical thing. I may suffer because of a resource which I don't need but someone below me needs and someone higher than me needs, okay. And that is what was happening on the Mars Pathfinder situation. Also that these intermediate tasks kind of, uh, okay. So, uh, so uh, simply not using a resource or uh, uh, that you are not a direct party doesn't help. You may actually suffer because of priorities of others. So, um, you said that uh, for each task you can only be blocked once every time? As a, no, 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 in the worst case. Right? So, so what if you were to follow this protocol, then in the worst case, a task may get blocked by a lower priority task at most once. And in the worst case, the time duration for that would be the time duration for the worst case critical section of this nature. Okay, so clearly there might be shared resources which are used only by tasks higher priority than me. Doesn't matter because those tasks would have blocked me anyway. There may be resources which are only used by tasks lower priority than me. Doesn't matter because I over, always overwrite them. The problem comes with resources which are used by someone lower priority than me and either by me or by someone higher than me. In that case, I may have to wait and the worst case time that I would wait is the duration of the worst case critical section. Okay, the time, time for which a lower priority task locks a resource, whatever is the maximum. So all these offending resources that we care about, right? So, the, uh, so, so let's think of an offending, potentially blocking resource being one, which is used by something lower priority than me and, and either by me or something higher priority than me. And then I can look at the maximum uh, of the usage time for these resources across all the lower priority tasks. And if I'm truly unlucky, then that's what I will hit. But that's it. I will hit it once and that's it in any, uh, in any, any given run. Okay? Whereas without this protocol, we could have waited multiple times, once for each such resource. I'm sorry. Again, to the same Mm -hmm. in the uh, I mean at T2, okay. you block task 1, right? At T2, uh, task 1 had, is suspended because, yes. yeah. Yes, I, I imagine that uh, task 1 needs uh, the light source for shorter time than for, uh, it will take S1 and release it before, S, before task 2 ne needed. Oh, okay. F fair enough. Okay. So what you're saying is what if this guy needed S1 for a very short time? Yes. Okay. Uh, and then it, w and it could have released. Now the problem in this particular case is that you would, you're assuming that I use a resource in a non-nested fashion. Okay. That is I need use S1, release S1 before I need S2. And if I knew that, I certainly could. So the point you're reading is actually kind of a subtle one. How much information will a task give to the OS? And that you typically do through some API and you don't want to make it super complicated because um, right now a task has to tell, uh, we have to tell up front to the OS that I'm going to use this resource. To make your scheme work, I also have to tell it all possible permutations in which I can use that, those resources. That is, I'll use S1, release S1, do S2 and do it across all possible pathways in the code. Conceivably, you could. You could basically say that, I'm using resources S1 and S2, and these are the permutations in which I can use them. That is, uh, like in this case, the permutation was lock S1, lock S2, release S2, release S1. But there are 
all sorts of other possibilities. If you convey all of them to the OS, then certainly OS could do a smarter decision. The problem is that it's very hard to con have API. I mean, the more complicated you make the API or kind of larger the information you're passing, bigger the chances of taking the mistake. So right now, the assumption is that all the OS knows is that you are using a resource, okay, and not which order you are using them in. Actually, it has to know that the duration of the usage as may just two blocks me for a very long time you have to know that you use uh, you have to know the duration for which uh, i use a resource okay uh, usually the uh, amount of time you use a resource uh, i mean it's, it's kind of like the worst case execution time okay so i may not may, may know the time, usage time but your strategy won't work out here because s1 is locked and then s2 is locked so if i let it proceed uh, s1 locked and then uh, so even if let's say S1 usage time was very tiny, the problem is that S2 is sandwiched inside S1. So that won't work, right? Because let's imagine I let task one lock S1 at T2, okay? Then a little bit later, it will need S2, but S2 is already locked. So then task one will be stuck, but then this guy, before it can proceed, it needs S1, but S1 is already locked. So in this usage pattern where one person is using it S1 inside S2, another is using S2 inside S1, you better not enter beyond this thing. But in some other usage patterns, it could be that you may proceed. But the OS has no way of knowing that detail of information. It has to assume, in, at this point, it has to assume the worst case situation, which is you may also need S2 because you have said that you use S2. And that this guy may need S1 because this guy has also declared that it uses S1. So uh, it's, it's guarding against that worst case scenario. Okay. So this is this is OCPP and it has this nice property which is uh, block ones. Going back to our original example with those four tasks, so what will happen now is L1 executes, uses Q, at t equal to 2, L2 and L3 arrive, L3 is high priority, it runs. Now at this point, L3 needs V, except L3 will check, is there a resource in the system which is currently locked and whose priority is greater than or equal to L3's? And indeed there is, there is a resource Q whose priority is that of L4 and it is currently locked. So if you notice out here, L3, even though resource V is available, is unable to progress. And likewise, L2 will reach the same conclusion because L2 will say, okay, uh, sorry, uh, so at, at this stage, uh, this is blocked. And L, L1 has the high high priority. So uh, so this is kind of uh, blocked also. This is unable to run either. And instead, L1 runs. And then at t equal to 4, L4 arrives. Now L4, um, uh, will get to run. It has uh, uh, high priority because remember L1 thus far uh, has not inherited L4 priority because it hasn't blocked it yet. It has just used Q. So at this stage L4 will run but at this point when L4 needs the resource uh, Q it will find itself blocked and then this guy uh, L1 will get its priority. L1 will run, come out of it uh, L4 will finish, then this guy will get the CPU, then this guy will get the CPU, and so on and so forth. Uh, what you will see out here is L4 is getting blocked only once because uh, um, uh, for a period of time which corresponds to, uh, which in the worst case can correspond to four time units because L1 needs the CPU for four time units. These two guys are getting, getting blocked for three time units, which is still in the aggregate equal uh, less than equal to four. So each one of these three tasks can, in the worst case, get blocked for four time units because L1 uses a resource for four time units and Q is also used by L4. For L4, the equation would have said it can block once for Q or once for V and the duration of block would be the maximum. So for Q, the maximum is four, for V, the maximum is two. So it would have said max of four comma two, which is four. In this case, the actual blocking is two. 
in this example. But in some other contrived scenario, you could have blocked for four. Uh, in this example, at time three, mm -hmm. uh, for task number one, the is getting inherited the priority of task number three. Is that true? As an inheritance? At this point, it is inheriting the task priority of task so number three. Gets raised. Right. Is it that, priority gets so raised. My question is that then time eleven, mm -hmm. we are resetting that priority of task one. Because it's no longer one. Because it is no longer blocking it. So we need to remember past priorities for that task. Don't have to remember past priority. Basic thing is that a task has uh, the pr uh, priority gets raised if it is blocking someone. And it's getting lower again. Yeah, yeah. So you do have to remember the native priority of the task. Okay, absolutely. Yeah. So native priority over the statically assigned priority is maintained, and then uh, the effective priority is the maximum of that plus anything I'm blocking. Okay. So it, as you can imagine, this obviously requires a lot more bookkeeping by the OS, and which is why these things are not found in. Uh, uh, simpler variants, okay, I mean most of the static priority type OSs that you will see will do not have the priority priority ceiling protocol. VxWorks does, okay, and other similar kind of industrial strength stuff do, but this is not something you will find in kind of a typical open source type systems. Uh, get, uh, doing these things correctly and getting them right is um, yeah, just more overhead um, uh, as well. ICPP is a variant on this thing. It came kind of later as sort of often happens in academic work. So each process has a static default priority, much like before. Each resource has a static priority, static ceiling value, again it's before. Um, uh, and in this particular case, the difference out here is the following. A, proce uh, so a process has a dynamic priority that is maximum of its own static priority and the ceiling values of any resources it has blocked. So there is a, what is the difference that you see from OCPP? So here, uh, in the previous case, the actual priority, the effective priority of a task was changed when it actually blocked someone, okay? Whereas here, it is raised the moment it uses a resource. Okay, so that's so that's why it's called immediate. Okay, so in the previous one, I may use a resource, but if it's not resulting in anyone being blocked, then fine, my priority remains unchanged. Whereas here, the moment I use a resource, my priority jumps to the priority of that resource. Okay, and the way it kind of plays out out here is the following. Um, by way of example, L1, L1 uses S2, oh, sorry, L1 uses Q, and Q's priority is that of four. So right at this point, L1 will get the priority of 4, the priority 4. And therefore, that's why when L2 and L3 arrive, nothing happens. This guy keeps running. Okay. So in this case, the priority jump happened here. Whereas in the previous case, the priority jump happened at this point. Okay. So in one case, I the priority is changed only when there is actual blocking happening. And in the other case, the priority is changes happening as soon as a resource is used. This thing, right? Well, so so the idea out here is that it's a system where uh, before you can start running any thread, you have to declare all the threads along with the resources they are using before you enter the runtime. So there's kind of a, at the beginning, either at compile time, if you may, or at the beginning, there is a piece of code where you have to declare all the threads. So another way of saying is that I cannot declare a new thread after I have started a thread, after I have started some thread. So I have to enter my thread runtime system only after I have declared all the threads that exist in the system. It's like offline. It's like offline, exactly, or whatever runtime but upfront okay so uh, so and and not only that i have to also declare for each one of those thread what resources they are using i cannot insert them later on and only only then the system would say okay this is a safe system to proceed it, i do meet the deadline so kind of the idea in these things are the following that uh, there is a thread creation phase and there is a separate thread running phase all the thread creations have to happen before any 
thing is run and in the creation phase you have to tell what all resources are being used you have to tell the t's and the c's and the critical section durations and all, all of those things have to be told to the runtime system it will basically say as a result of this do i have a schedulable system or not if yes proceed if not uh, warn the user okay so uh, yeah you cannot just dynamically start using stuff unfortunately in this one actually if we go to the outline so why you get why you uh, why you give the resource to l1 uh, in the same time, you know that some other processes will come and will need this one. I mean, in generic case, you may lose if you give the resource to L1, as, as there is a, some uh, on your table, there's some resource that will need. Uh, right, okay, so a so, so, co couple of points out here. Uh, one is, and, and uh, well, or one main point really out here is the following most people like to have schedulers which are work conserving. What is meant by that is if the CPU is free or the resource is free and there is someone ready to use it, we would rather like to proceed using it. Okay, so you're right. If I knew, if I can knew, uh, know something about the future, then a more, a different decision could indeed be that let the CPU idle out here. Okay, uh, those kind of schedulers also exist, but they're much harder to analyze. So the problem, the reason you avoid those things is because, uh, if, so while uh, that, the theoretical understanding of those things isn't there. So we cannot really say anything about the schedulability and all in that case. Although yes, intuitively that, that is a plausible strategy. Okay. So kind of underlying all of this is also this notion that the reason we are doing all of this is because we want to be able to say beforehand, before running the system, will any deadline be missed? Which means that we need to have the necessary mathematical theory to be able to answer that question. And for the scenarios you're describing, we don't have that. Okay, or at least it's not easily done. Let's put it this way. Any other question on this one? Okay, so OCPP versus ICPP, uh, they're actually um, worst case behavior is the same. Both of them guarantee exactly the same set of properties. Really, the main thing is that in case of ICPP, there are fewer context switches because uh, uh, we kind of just do it up front. Every time I block someone, I don't have to kind of do it. But uh, uh, flip side is ICPP has more uh, priority movements because I, every time I use a resource, the priority changes, even though no actual blocking may happen. Okay, so that's kind of a trade-off. What is more expensive? Okay, well, context switches, obviously we know uh, it results in saving registers and stuff like that, right? I mean, so that cost is well known. Priority movement also has a cost because you are maintaining a sorted list and now you want to pluck something out and put, put it back somewhere, uh, put it into a different place in the queue. So you are going to have some sort of a data structure uh, where this kind of removal and reinsertion has to take place and you still have to keep things sorted. And uh, that data structures, on, uh, if you have a lot of processes and that, that part can take some time and that that's an overhead so uh, which one wins kind of depends uh, really so in one case you are saving on state saving and restore in the other case you are saving on uh, the movements and the priority queue that has been maintained so one final bit on static priority um, is the notion of arbitrary deadline so so thus far our static priority framework that we have developed works for deadline equal to period, works for deadline less than equal to period, works for independent tasks, and works for tasks which have uh, shared resources with uh, kind of the model that we showed. Um, we, for deadline equal to period, optimum is rate monotonic. For deadline less than period, optimum is deadline monotonic. If tasks have, and in case of independent tasks, if tasks share resources, then we don't, we cannot say rate monotonic or deadline monotonic are optimum. Okay, so you cannot just blindly proceed with that. And then finally, when deadlines are greater than the period, which means that I may have multiple jobs of a task in my system, in that case, there is no known optimality result. That is, if you are trying to do static priority, you have to try all possible combinations, all possible factorial and combinations of priorities. 
But having said that, kind of uh, just, just to see how it plays out, so let's imagine I have two tasks. Uh, one has a computation time of 28, period of 80, the other has computation time of 71, period of 110. And let's, for the sake of argument, assume that the deadlines are very large. Okay, so they are much, much greater than T1 and T2. And the main point I want to show is that uh, our critical instant out here is a little bit tricky one. Okay, so let's look at this. So let's imagine that I'm looking at response time for task two. And let's say I have decided to give task one the higher priority. Okay, so I'm checking out the scenario where task one has a higher priority, task two has the lowest priority. And we start out. So at initiation time, uh, the task arrives. And if I look at out here, um, uh, this guy needs uh, 71 uh, time units, this guy needs 28 time units at t equal to 0, both come uh, together. So this guy gets 28 CPU, CPU time, then this guy starts running, but then at t1 equal to 80, another copy of task 1 will come. So the first time, the first job of task 2 will finish after 28 plus 28 plus 71, which is 127. Okay, So completion time is 127 for the copy of the task 2 which came at t equal to 0 and therefore I could say the response time is 127 okay and let's say I want to not do anything else let's say I want to just look at that then you would say okay uh, uh, response time of task 2 at the critical instant is 127 and if I were to have told you that the deadline was let's say 127 then you would have said things are fine it's schedulable but the problem is that's not the case out here. If I were to remember at uh, 110, a second copy of task 2 also had arrived. It was just sitting in the system. And if I were to look at its response time, it's 116. Terrific. It's even better than 127. At time t equal to 220, another copy would have arrived. Okay, so I'm just letting the system flow. Its response time is 133. And now it has suddenly exceeded that, right? So main, main thing is a critical instant assumption, which basically said the worst case response time for a task is when it arrives at the same time as every higher priority task, and I were just looking at the response time of that thing, is no longer true. I actually may have to go farther out, okay, to find out the worst case task. In this particular case, it was actually, yeah, if we scan down the list, 133 here and 28 out here so much farther down the list and in fact how far ahead you have to look you have to keep looking until you get a response time which is less than the period okay if response time are always more than the period then you will uh, never convert okay so there has to be eventually the system has to reach uh, repeat itself basically so main message out here is that if deadlines are greater than pri uh, period then number one, there is no optimality result. So to find whether the system is schedulable or not, you have to literally try all the factorial n combination uh, permutations of priority assignments. And number two, you cannot simply say, okay, at the critical instant, I look at the response time of the first job and be done with it. You actually have to keep doing it until uh, you end up with a response time which is less than equal to the period and then look for the maximum within this. So in this particular case, this task set is schedulable as long as my deadlines are greater than or equal to 133. If the deadline is less than 133 and, uh, and I'm giving task to the lower priority, then the system is not schedulable. Is it possible for the response time to be always lower than the period? Sure, it's possible, depend, depend, depending upon the task. For example, I mean, trivially speaking, it would be possible if let's say C1 was equal to 1. Like if C1 was very small, then each one of these, because remember, computation time of this guy is 72. So I have actually, within each period, I have a fair bit of laxity, right? So I have a fair bit of gap. The problem is that uh, this thing is coming more frequently, and it's also consuming a lot of time, right? So within that 110, I have to budget for two cycles of 28, 56. So out of 110, 56 gets taken away. So I'm only, I was only getting 44. But that is because we started out kind of uh, a copy of each one of them. Uh, if I were to, in this very example, if I, instead of 28, I had made it to be, uh, taking the extreme case, C1 equal to 1, things would have been fine. So you said that you stop looking for worst case when the period... Stop looking for worst case when the response time is less than the period. So 
what if the first one that you saw is already less than the then, then you're done. Then, then the future will not. Because remember, if I finish before the period, then again, in the worst case, it's as if a system would restart. So if you work it out, you would see that it will never, since I already finished before the period, that the next task that is arriving, next job, the one at 110 that is arriving, it can only, it can at most be as bad as I am in the sense that it may face T1 arriving also at 110. In this case, it doesn't happen, but right? Or, uh, so, so the situation can only be better or whatever. It can never be worse than what I face, right? So what this basically says is arbitrary deadline case is trickier. Besides from an implementation perspective is trickier. Your system has to have a buffering and all. But uh, if you had multiple cores and you were to say, okay, you know, the one which arrived at 110, maybe I can run it on a different core. Uh, you may have other issues there also besides this complication. What, what issue that you think you can have? So let's say I were to have multiple cores and I were to say, okay, uh, this copy, which is still running, I am running on core number one, but let me run this guy at core number two. May depend on the resistance. May depend on the resistance. Yeah, many times these systems are stateful. Okay, that means there is a state which is carried from one job to the next job of the same task, in which case I cannot do. There is an implied dependency out there. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, that's, that's kind of the main thing uh, to worry about. Oftentimes also, they may use some accelerator or some resource, and so they may be depend, there may be shared resources that may occur between them, and you have to really watch out for them now, okay, because you are conflicting with yourself. Okay, so implementation wise, uh, while it is possible that these different copies could be farmed out onto different things, you have to do it very, very carefully. So, uh, but let's say we had arbitrary deadline and you are willing to try out all those factorial and permutation of priorities, then we can still go back to our older framework uh, for calculating the response time. So we basically, now the only thing I have to worry about is in each step, I have to actually I have to look uh, not just the first job, but multiple jobs. So what this is saying is the following. If I were to look at the qth job, which came after the critical instant, remember we can no longer be guaranteed, uh, be happy with just the first job which came at the critical instant. So I have to look at successive jobs. So the qth job that uh, of a ith task, which came at, uh, uh, came at, the critical instant, uh, after the critical instance, it will see some blocking time because of our shared resources. It will need to execute Q plus one time. So we are starting with zero. So the first instant, the first job, we call it job number zero, and then one, two, three through Q. So I will, I will, uh, this ith task will need to run Q plus one times CI. And then we will have the term corresponding to interference from all the higher priority tasks. So the idea is that you solve this equation for q equal to 0. And if the stopping criterion is not met, then you solve it for q equal to 1, and so on and so forth. You kind of keep proceeding until, and the stopping criterion is the following. So if I were to look at response time of the qth instance, then that is, uh, that is, so this is now, the interpretation out here is this is a finished time. So it's the finished time of the qth instance minus the arrival time of the qth instance. That is going to be the response time. This qth instance would have arrived at q times ti. It finishes at whatever this equation predicted. And our stopping criterion is response time is less than equal to the period, okay, which is what we were discussing earlier. So moment I see, uh, so I keep, start with q equal to zero, which is the very first job. And if this stopping criterion is met, I can stop. Otherwise, I do it for q equal to one, q equal to two. In our previous example, we were doing, so this is q equal to zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we'll have to go all the way to q equal to seven before I hit response time less than equal to uh, the period. So arbitrary deadline case is trickier. And then of course the response time is maximum of all the response times I encountered. Now, uh, this, I guess at some level, this is largely of theoretical interest because we don't implement systems in this complicated way. I mean, life is, as it is, 
quite complicated with these things. So uh, deadlines greater than period and all you don't encounter. I mean, usually you just would say, okay, if my deadline is very relaxed, I'll just say deadline equal to the period so that I just finish it before the next one arrives and keep life simple because then you have a lot more theory to back you up, rate monotonic and all. Whereas with this, it's not the case. Okay, so uh, that was a story with uh, uh, static priority. So uh, we saw kind of pretty much most of the stuff which is known out there. There's some additional results on what if the tasks arriving are not exactly periodic? What if they can come plus minus some delta around the period? Okay, which usually happens because um, the task may be coming from over a network or something. They may not be strictly periodic, so they may have a jitter uh, in their release time. Uh, so there are some theories around that. What if we had? Uh, uh, if what if we knew how much context switching took? Uh, how much time context switching took place. Um, again, the assumption thus far was context switching was very quick, okay, but in reality it takes some time and during that time the processor is not necessarily uh, uh, preemptible. So that's another area of work. And then the final thing is what if processor has power management so that it is shut down, uh, what can I do about that? And what if uh, it allows frequency to be changed? How would I use that? So thus far the assumption was while I'm running the processor speed remains unchanged. Um, modern processors let you change the speed either because you wish to do it. So you could imagine all this rate monotonic theory but done for power optimization. That is whenever I'm running a task I also have control over what speed I'm running it at. So in conceptually I'm not giving you a C sub I. I'm giving you a possible set of C sub i depending upon what speed I'm running it uh, and I could dynamically change the frequency. So all of these things are complications, <laughs> there are sort of plenty of results and systems and all kind of known, known around that uh, to benefit from. One other uh, thing uh, I also want to mention was today's EE seminar is on a topic called approximate computing which is very closely tied with uh, the stuff kind of the idea is that uh, many a times if I'm unable to meet a performance guarantee, then perhaps I could do com compute an approximate result. Okay, fewer bits, maybe lesser accuracy or some other things. So, so this is this is this is uh, very commonly encountered in signal processing kind of situations as in many other domains. So this idea that I could, I have another knob that I have access to. So thus far the assumption was task either meets the deadline or fails the deadline. But you could have another dimension which basically say meets the deadline but with a lower accuracy. And that's perfectly fine too. And uh, the reason these kind of ideas are picking up quite a bit is that there are a lot of uncontrolled variations in uh, hardware now, okay. So as long as it was things were under my control, I am shutting it down, I'm changing the frequency, that's great. But what if the processor, because of whatever reasons, like temperature rising or manufacturing was different or whatever, has to, in an uncontrolled fashion, vary from whatever you think it would be doing. Okay, so when I give you the C sub i, uh, yeah, so, so let's take an example. Uh, so C sub i are calculated on, you're probably going to run it on some machine. You'll say, okay, it took so many clock cycles. My processor is 500 megahertz, so I'm going to just run on that. But what if the clock speed changes? What if uh, the processor heats up? So the actual C sub I MAC may actually differ. Uh, so these, these kind of uh, things basically inevitably lead you towards that, you know, I can maybe still meet the deadline, but perhaps I could um, uh, sacrifice on the accuracy. Okay. So actually that also reminds me that lecture on Wednesday is going to be given by a postdoc of mine. It's going to be on this theme of variability. So uh, the E seminar is on specifically about approximate computing and uh, Lucas Warner, my postdoc, he's going to give a lecture on uh, how does va this variation happen and how do we kind of cope with it. There are many sources of variations, okay. Uh, some well understood, some less so. Uh, so he'll, 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 he'll talk about that. But in this Slide set, let's go uh, relax uh, and other stuff. So thus far we basically said that look, priorities were fixed. And the only time at which you were willing to change priority was when we were sharing resources. So we had that dynamic priority kind of entering there. What if uh, we were to really make dynamic priority 
uh, upfront bargaining uh, thing. So the idea out here now is that we do not assign upfront any static priority to the tasks, but rather let the OS assign them on some basis, in particular on the basis of something to do with the actual state of the system. So one of the most commonly used algorithm is called EDF, earliest deadline first, or sometimes it's called least time to go. What it is saying is that at any given point in time, the highest priority task is the one whose deadline is the closest to now. Okay, this is the, the term deadline out here is different than deadline relative to arrival. Thus far deadline we were using that once the job arrives, how much time do I have to finish it? This is, this is a different notion of deadline. This is saying right now is 1 p.m. and I have a list of tasks and they all had, they were released at some point in time and they had some corresponding finish time. Whose finish time is the closest to now? Okay, so that's what it means least time to go. And priorities are assigned in that order. So the task which is which has to finish the soonest from now is the one which has the highest priority. And what that means is that every time there is a scheduling event, like a task finishes, a new task comes, um, interrupt happens, whatever, uh, I may have to recompute this priority. Okay, every time like a new task comes, and it may be that it's it's really uh, it's it's time to finish. That is the absolute wall clock time by which it was finished. Uh, will dictate where in the queue I put it. Okay, so I need some sort of a sorted priority queue kind of a structure in which I'm going to put these things in order. There is a another algorithm which is has the same optimality properties but uh, perhaps uh, used a little bit less often. It's called least laxity first. And what this says is that, uh, so let's say I'm looking at a task at some time t. It, has, it is supposed to finish uh, by some time t prime, which is greater than t. So the available time that I have to finish this task now is t prime minus t. But some part of this task has already finished. So out of it c sub i, some fraction is already finished. Whatever is remaining better be less than whatever time remaining I have. So when I start out, I have to do computation c i and I have time equal to d sub i. Okay, so my laxity in that case is d sub i minus c sub i. But as time progresses, this task may not get the CPU and therefore its laxity may start decreasing. And kind of intuitively the idea is that more urgent are those tasks which have less laxity. Okay, so in particular, if I have a task whose remaining computation time is equal to the time by which it must finish from now, then I better handle that but because otherwise it will miss a step line. So least laxity first, assign the task to the processor with the uh, uh, least laxity and it is less steadied even though in terms of a scheduling property it is exactly the same. So EDF actually is found in some of the operating systems. It is far more popular or commonly used in networking equipment okay where EDF is a lot more common although EDF there is non-preemptive EDF that is uh, once I give the task, it, I will let it finish before I do. Uh, in operating systems, you are going to find EDF which is preemptive, okay, which is uh, kind of a difference. And um, to the best of my knowledge, none of the common, uh, commonly used commercial uh, OSs kind of use uh, EDF, but there are plenty of, um, let's say, more researchy operating systems which have that capability. So preemptive earliest deadline first, the way kind of it basically uh, works is that priorities change with the closeness of a task to its absolute deadline. So let what, what is known about it? So firstly, uh, one key result is that EDF is among pre optimum among, among all preemptive scheduling algorithm um, for uh, periodic tasks and also one shot tasks. So let me uh, describe that. So let's say I give you a set of tasks and I told you only one job of each task will come, okay? And they are released at some time and I basically say, okay, how will you schedule it? Uh, and if you, you're, and you want to do preemptive, um, okay? So in that case, EDF is uh, optimum in the sense if EDF cannot do it, then nothing can. Moreover, if I have a set of periodic independent tasks, so I give you the T's and the C's um, and then Again, uh, EDF is optimum in the sense that EDF cannot do it among any preemptive algorithm, okay, then nothing else can, 
Okay, so it's a much more powerful result than we had for rate monotonic. In rate monotonic, we were sticking with static priority here. It's basically saying you are free to assign priorities whichever way, but EDF priority assignment is optimum in the sense it, if it doesn't work, nothing else will work. Main theorem, and which is kind of tells you why it is like that, is let's say I have a set of uh, periodic tasks. Um, and uh, I'm given the T, C's, D's, and all, uh, may, uh, and I'm looking at the case where deadline is equal to period, then it's basically saying that an EDF algorithm will schedule if processor utilization is less than equal to one, okay? Which pretty much basically says that if EDF, if anything can be scheduled, <coughs> that is, uh, processor utilization is one, then EDF can do it. Uh, and of course, if it is more than one, then there is just physically impossible for anything to schedule it, okay. So EDF is kind of pretty cool in that regard that you just compute the processor utilization and do it with all these caveats. It's basically relative, uh, it, 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 uh, it, it has to uh, deadline equal to period, then uh, the task should be independent and all. There is no simple schedulability test if deadlines are not equal to period. Uh, you basically have to uh, kind of simulate the system in effect. You have to kind of start out with something and let it proceed and kind of see what would happen, okay. And then also for multiprocessor case, things get trickier also, okay. Multiprocessor case where there are, uh, um, uh, you, you, you may have to kind of move tasks around as well across the processors. So, um, the I have a couple of slides on the proof behind this thing. Um, um, so one direction of the proof that uh, uh, the only if part of it, I mean needless to say if u greater than 1, then I need more processor time than the time I have available, so obviously it's not going to be schedulable, so that sort of remains true. Um, for the other direction, uh, uh, basically what, uh, so I'm not going to walk through the proof entirely, but basically what it tries to do is the following. It says, okay, let's assume u is less than 1, so, but the task set is not schedulable, which basically means that there must be some place where there's a deadline miss happening. That is, my task needs more time than I had available for this thing. Uh, and what, uh, what it tries to do in this particular case is that it basically goes through, um, I'm, I'm not going to walk through this one, but it basically shows, uh, goes through that there is a contradiction ends up happening by computing how much time I had available. So let's, uh, see. so at T1, uh, at T2 I have a deadline this happening. and I walk back from T2 and there must have been some time T1 at which a task was released and the processor was contiguously busy after that, okay? And if I look at this time, time period, then what the proof, roughly speaking, does is, it basically says, what is the total computation time I would have needed in that period, T1 over T2? And then it basically shows that there is a contradiction arises because we know also that U is less than one, okay? So, uh, trust me, kind of this basically just says, there is a result which basically says that U less than equal to one means EDF can schedule it, provided deadline equal to period and provided the tasks are independent. Um, for deadline less than period uh, case, you actually have to do the simulation of the thing. And the way it works, and, and this is a more general case because deadlines may, uh, so, so deadline greater than period, again, uh, no clean approach, but deadline less than period, the way it, uh, uh, which, which often happens, my deadline may be tighter than the period. So the way it kind of works is the following. So I have to do this simulation, but you'll map it into a set of equations. So let's say I'm looking at some time interval T1, T2. And during that time, what will happen is that uh, some tasks will arrive. Uh, they will have some deadlines, so I will have some demand on the processor. Let's call that demand on the processor to be G sub i T1 comma T2, okay? So it's basically, uh, sorry, uh, demand because of task i. So in the interval T1 to T2, I'm looking at the demand on that processor because of task number i. Now what will happen out here is the following, that we have to look at uh, all those instances, all those jobs of ih task, which came after T1, uh, 
which start uh, which were released at T1 or afterwards, but whose deadline was T2 or before. Okay, because anything else could go in the interval before or can go in the interval after. So this is how we define this. Thing. And now if we look at the whole task set, then the total demand in the processor is the summation of this across all the tasks that there is. So now we have a formula which basically says in a given time interval, what is the total demand on the processor? Okay, and obviously uh, it stands to reason that for any T1, T2, it must be the case that the demand on the processor must be less than or equal to the time available. If that is violated for any pair of T1, T2, then sort of I have a problem. So feasibility, so the key result out here, and it, I'm kind of hand waving my way through a little bit out here, but basically says that schedulability happens if and only if this property holds true. Okay, um, so with that insight, kind of uh, the way things are developed is according to the following. So we try to compute how many, uh, remember here we just said everything which is released after T1 and before T2. Uh, you can actually uh, come up with how many of these things are going to be released. So we basically say how many instances of task I contribute to the demand in that interval. And that is given by this complicated looking formula which in part also looks, takes into account the phase of task I, that is when was the first copy of that task was released. Because if I'm looking at a T1, T2, it's possible that a copy of task I was released exactly at T1 versus it was released a little bit after T1. Whether that will happen or not will depend upon when the first copy of I arrived and I'm looking at a particular T1. So if T1, uh, so, so let's say the first copy of task arrived at time phi sub i, then the next copy will arrive at phi sub i plus uppercase ti, you know, copy after that will be 2 times ti and 3 times ti and so on and so forth. In those cases, if my time interval were to start from those specific things, I will, uh, I will have something right at the beginning, otherwise the first instance I have to consider would be a little bit later. So the formula has to take this into account, it's a bit of an algebra, but main point is I can compute this thing. I can, given a T1, T2 and knowing when the first copy of the task arrives and knowing the period and the deadlines, I can compute what all terms contribute to the sigma, okay. So, uh, so now what the processor demand approach basically translates into is saying is the following that Let's assume, uh, let, let's start with uh, periodic tasks which are all simultaneously released, okay? And then uh, what we do is we perform that test for every interval 0 comma L. And uh, so I compute how many tasks, how many jobs of I are released in the interval 0 to L and that formula reduces to this, okay? So here L is the horizon I'm looking at, T sub I, D sub I, the period and the deadline. So the demand on the processor in the interval from t equal to 0, so some t equal to l is given by this expression. It's sum over all the tasks and then number of instances multiplied by c sub i. And the main thing that we have to make sure is that this thing is less than or equal to l for every possible l. So if there exists an l where uh, uh, so as long, so for all L, I have to make sure that this, this turns out to be the case because otherwise I'll have a deadline list kind of happening. So feasibility of a set of tasks uh, can be guaranteed if I were to able to verify this thing. So I try out all L and for cross on the tasks, I kind of keep doing this thing. Now, the problem obviously out here is should I really try it all else because do I try from L equal T equal to zero to equal to infinity? No. So the thing that you would like to do is somehow limit how many else I need to check for. So let's assume that we, all the tasks start at t equal to 0. Can you place a bound on what I need to check? How, how far ahead into the future you are going to check for? So I have a bunch of tasks and we start out start out with the case that first copy of each one of them came at the same time. We are trying to check that any interval 0 to L 
the demand from those tasks is less than equal to the time that was actually available. And naively looking at this is saying that all L, so L equal over 0 to infinity. Could you shrink this thing time? Hyper period. Hyper period, okay. So hyper period basically says I just take the LCM of all the T sub i. At that point, the system will repeat itself. So trivially speaking, I only need to check from 0 through the LCM or the hyper period of T sub i, at which point the system will repeat itself. Uh, could we do better that, okay, because hyper period could also be very long if I have tasks with kind of weirdo looking uh, things. So that's uh, what the um, actual test ends up doing. So it basically uh, starts, so let's take the case where period is equal to deadline, okay. So for period less than equal to, uh, um, uh, uh, so <coughs> for period equal to the relative deadline, uh, let's see. Um, the processor demand test, that's this particular test, is the, uh, so for period equal to deadline, this test is the same as saying this, this part. And there is a simple proof for this, but main point is that processor demand test translates into a good old utilization less than equal to one test. Um, the case that we have to worry about is what if period is not equal to deadline. So the idea is that could we reduce the number of intervals in which we need to check for this thing. Could we reduce the number of pl uh, places that we have to check for it? So first observation is tasks are periodic and uh, we started out with the critical instant t equal to zero. Then the schedule repeats at hyper period. So that's the point that Amru made. So I obviously have to check only uh, to L less than equal to H. Observation number two is that this function g0 comma L is a step function. Again, looking at this guy, it's a step function because only when the values inside uh, move from, uh, they, they jump from integer to integer. So whenever a deadline is crossed and until the next deadline, it kind of remains constant, right? Because uh, the workload on the processor would change only when I move from deadline of one task to one deadline to the next deadline. So what it means is that if the condition holds true for some L equal to dk, then it also holds true for all the intervals L until the next deadline period. So I don't need to check for them. I can only check for some discrete points. So what in turn it means is processor demand only needs to be verified for all values of L equal to absolute deadlines. So if I'm looking at the hyper period, during that hyper period for all my tasks, I would have some deadlines corresponding to different jobs of that task. And I only need to test for those. So, uh, so that's, that's the second observation out here. So I've suddenly reduced the continuous problem to kind of a bunch of discrete points and uh, uh, ac across all the tasks. Furthermore, we can also look at that this term, L plus Ti minus Di Ti, so floor term and therefore it must be less than or equal to this term okay, without a floor. So if we were to define another function g0 comma l with the uppercase g to be this term, so this is the same term as before but without the floor, then I can expand it out algebraically and you can show that this translates into this term, uh, um, is now a function of u. And Indeed, we know that we eliminated the floor out here. Therefore, it must be the case that the little g is always less than the big G. But the big G is, if you look at in terms of the lifetime, it is actually a linear function, right? It's of the form nu plus some constant term, okay? Because given a set of tasks, u is known, u sub i is known, ti is known, di is known. So this thing is nothing but uh, this function is just a line in L, uh, a linear function of L. So what that translates into the following, that uh, if I look at the evolution of the system, this line corresponds to L equal to T curve, which basically says that available time is equal to, uh, we, we always want to be kind of, um, uh, 
what, what we would like to do is to be, um, uh, th this, is, this, is, this is indicating that if I go above it, that means computation time was more than uh, available time during that period. So G0L is a function of L increasing with a slope u. So if u is less than or equal to 1, then there would be a line, L, uh, there would be an L equal to L star where the uppercase G, 0 comma L, must be equal to L. So what, this is what it is saying, that if I look at the line G, 0 comma L, if that line was always above L equal to 2, then L equal to T, then I will me never meet my criterion. I will never uh, have enough time. So there has to be some time at which this line uh, uh, falls below L equal to T because this line uh, is kind of the upper bound that I have and my actual little g is following some step function like this. So what we need to do is uh, uh, that compute this L star and uh, that could be computed by solving this equation and uh, uh, there is no need for me to check beyond this time because beyond this L star we know that G0L is little g is below big g and big g is below my L equal to t line. So the only portion I need to check for is this portion 0 to L star because that's the only place where a violation can happen. Anything above L star no violation can happen. So, so we started by saying hyper period that's a long time we can check for that. But then we are basically showing that, look, there must be an L star above which it must be the case that I am below uh, L equal to T line. So the only time in which I have to check is this particular interval 0 to L star. And during this time, we have to make sure that no violation happens. That's basic, basic property I have to check for. Um, uh, so schedulability test then boils down to is that for all L, we have to check that this condition is met, this is a little g, where we are only going to check at the de deadlines that occur during that interval, and we are only going to check during the period uh, from 0 through L, whatever is smaller, L star or H, hyper period or this L star. We only have to check for that. So uh, this is an example. I'm given a task set, uh, computation time, re relative deadlines, the actual periods. I calculate u, u is 11 over 12, uh, but uh, since my deadlines are not equal to period, so I cannot simply uh, go, uh, go with this, uh, go, uh, go with u less than equal to 1 test. So I calculate L star, I calculate hyper period. Hyper period is 72, L star is 25. So this says, so we start, uh, so instead of checking all the way to infinity, I would say I'll check to the uh, smaller of these two, so in this case 25, and within this 25, I will see what are all the deadlines that will happen if the tasks were to arrive at, first copy were to arrive at t equal to 0. So deadlines for task 1 are going to be at uh, 4, uh, then the next one would be 6 plus 4, 10, and so and so forth. So you would see out here that uh, this is going to be my set of things I'm going to check. 4, 5, 7, 10, 13, 15, 21, 22. These are the possible deadlines that can occur for across these tasks. And for each one of those, I compute the little g function, and then I make sure that this little g is less than the corresponding L. And in this particular case, you see that it's always met. Uh, that is, this column is always less than or equal to this column, which means that the workload was always less than the time available. Can I slow the CPU down? Oh. Hmm? When that is one time when 16 is same. Right. So this is a bottleneck. If I were to slow things down, then we will miss a dead, uh, at this stage, we'll have a problem. Okay. So uh, by looking at this, you can also find the laxity. So let's say we were to do this thing and we'll end up with some table. Then the slowest, uh, if I were to change the processor speed, then that would mean that all these Gs are going to be affected by some common factor alpha. And I can see what is that common factor alpha so that one of the rows just becomes critical. In this case, we were all already at criticality. This line 
uh, specifically saying that by in the interval 0 through 16, I have 16 units of time available and I needed to do computation of 16 units. Okay, so I'm right at the critical one in this example. But in other cases, there may be some laxity. Let's say for whatever reason this row wasn't there, then looking at this, well, I also have a 7, 7. So there are actually two critical elements out here. So this is, this is the test to apply when deadline is not equal to period but is less than equal to period. Okay, tasks are independent and you can have to wait um, uh, with this. And this is, so RM versus EDF, uh, rate monotonic or static priority is much more widely available because typical operating systems provide it. But having said that EDF actually uh, has some pretty good advantages also. Um, and uh, it also lets me make use of more of the processor because typically speaking in the case where deadline is equal to period, it's basically saying that 100% processor utilization, whereas with rate monotonic, we could not say that, okay? So this can actually let you get away with a lower speed processor than otherwise, okay? And that's its kind of big plus, but it comes at a higher overhead, that is OS has to do more work. So one could say there's more, we, uh, I mean, that's the counter aspect of it, which is I need a processor where some time will now go into operating system level housekeeping, which rate monotonic didn't have to do. What about the schedulability test, which is easier? Hmm? Well, so if deadline equal to period, RM still required kind of solving the whole system, okay, simulating the thing, whereas here the test is utilization rate less than equal to one. So, but if deadline is not equal to period, then both are complicated. Okay, so we're going to stop out here. Um,